two, one. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. And um, my name is Rhonda Anstead, and I am um, the founder of Be The Change uh, Career Consulting and also the creator of My Career Design Studio. And I am an RPCV myself. I was served in South Africa in um, 2007 to 2009. And since then, I have been working with a lot of RPCVs and people in the social impact field to help them find their right fit career and to identify what that is. And then from there to figure out a job strategy to get them there. And overall, networking is one of the most efficient and effective ways of getting that job. And it is also one of the least favorite ways of people to get the job. So that's why I want to talk to you today about, um, about how to network when that does not come natural to you. And so throughout this um, presentation, I do want to make this as interactive as possible. So there'll be some times when I'll pause, I'll ask some questions and ask for responses. You can either do that in, in the chat or you can unmute your microphone and share there. But let's just get started by um, asking why, why networking? Okay, so I talked about how it's efficient and effective, but there's another component of um, the job search that isn't mentioned all that often. And that is that a majority of jobs that are filled are never posted. So these jobs, some of them are filled through internal hires, but some of them are just word of mouth. And so if you are not in an organization or a company's network, then you won't know about these jobs. The, Besides this being a majority of the jobs that are out there, when you find jobs this way um, through your network, then they tend to be much less competitive. By the time a job hits Indeed or Monster or any of the other job boards or DevX, generally they get inundated with, with job applications. And so if you can find jobs before they hit a job board, then you are just increase your chances of actually getting that job. And the other thing is, this is kind of how things work. Um, most people have gotten their current job through their network, either primarily or secondarily. And, um, and I'm assuming that most people who are listening to this can point to a couple of jobs, one or two that they got simply through their network. It was the first, my first real job after college. I got that because I was related to somebody who worked at the company that I got a job with. So it's, um, so it really is the most effective way of getting a job. And the other thing to realize is that hiring is a really expensive process. Um, advertising, you know, coming up with a job description, advertising, reviewing resumes, talking to the candidates, conducting the interview, the meetings to decide who we're going to hire, all of that to bring in a person that you don't really know if they're going to match your organizational culture or not they're going to be a good fit. So a lot of people actually, a lot of companies really encourage and appreciate internal referrals because that takes some of the risk out of the process. So in order to encourage people to refer for upcoming jobs, many companies actually give a referral bonus to their employees. So I think this is useful to know. This isn't universal, but often when we think about networking our way into a job, we feel like we are asking someone a favor. And that's one of the mind shifts that I want us to do today is to realize that 
by asking for help, by asking for leads, by asking to someone to be a referral to for us can also be helping them as well. So it's not just a matter of, you know, you supplicating or, you know, trying to figure out a way to get your favor granted. Um, this really often is a mutually beneficial exchange. And so that's one of the reasons why, um, why I wanted to focus on this. And, and I honestly think that networking does not get nearly as much attention as resume writing or interviewing or even how to write cover letters when actually sometimes you can skip all of that simply by networking. So I want to ask the people here, um, wh what is it about networking? So I'm putting in a very provocative work. Why do you hate networking? And maybe you don't hate it, but I would like to hear from you. What are some of the, the challenges, some of the things that make you uncomfortable about networking? So again, you can either put that in the chat and Jody can read that to me, or if you're feeling brave, then um, please unmute yourself. And I just want to hear from a few of you of um, why is this so hard? This is Megan, no, just verbalize. <laughs> um, I feel like it's uh, cold calling, but with the added disadvantage of the fact that you're face to face. So it, that puts a lot more on the line, I think. Yeah, okay, so you're face to face, so you see how they respond to you and their body language and all of that, but also that you're putting yourself out there without any kind of previous connection, is that right? Correct, that's, I'm thinking of like the ultimate cold calling sort of um, uh, scenario. Right, right. And so when you think of networking, what, what do you think of? What, um, so are you thinking about like being in, you know, some networking event where you go up and hand your business card to someone? Say a little bit more about what, what networking means to you. I know the company I've been with for 15 years, they basically, they say your career is your own and it's all about networking and they're not kidding. Um, and I personally imagine a bar because that's typically what it is and you have to go and, you know, play the reindeer games to get the credit and those types of things. And so it's taken on a very negative tinge for me when it, you know, it could be, it could be fun. It could be an opportunity to meet people for other things too. Right, right. So, so I think that's a really important point that you raise is that there are a ton of networking events that are very artificial and forced. And um, like you said, sometimes they have little, you know, people bingo or scavenger hunts or something like that, um, where, you know, it's designed to help you get to know people and that can be useful but it's not necessarily what we would do on a day-to-day -day basis and how we would choose to spend our time. Yeah, so thank you for sharing that. Is there anybody else who just um, wants to talk about why, why they hate, ne hate networking? Rhonda, um, I have another one in the chat box that came in and mm. um, Carlotta shared, it's awkward. I'm okay with meeting new people, but when I'm looking for a job, the interaction immediately becomes different for me. It feels like an interview for me. Right, right, exactly. And so again, you're coming in with the, I'm asking for a favor, I'm asking for something, and I'm asking for something really big. I mean, a job is not, hey, do you have a quarter that I can use to you know, pay my parking meter? Although we don't use quarters anymore, do we? It's mostly credit cards. But yeah, I mean, you're asking for something that's super important to you and that puts a lot of pressure on. So, um, so I wanna talk, so if there's any, anything else that people wanna share, feel free to interrupt me because I'm just gonna start talking a little bit about um, the fact that I hate networking. And, um, and it is a skill that I've developed, but
but I've been in a lot of these situations um, that Megan has described um, that just aren't comfortable. And, um, and I have found that the reasons why I hate networking tend to be pretty similar to why other people do. So, um, so one of the really common things that we hear um, as career consultants is that networking is just kind of slimy and skeevy, you know, <laughs> you feel like you're, <laughs> Love it. like you're a salesperson, right? And that you're the product. And so you're trying to just be all smooth or you think you should be. Um, and most of the people that I work with are pretty modest as well. And so trying to talk yourself up is uh, not natural and, um, and really not how you want to be spending your time. Um, and another thing that for me is I was raised to be pretty independent and autonomous. I think a lot of people in, in our culture were. And I think as RPCVs, we can see how, how very American this attitude of pull yourself up by your bootstraps is. And that a lot of other cultures are much more communal and don't have as many challenges asking for help. But for me, it is a challenge. And, um, and so I'd rather just be able to um, do what I need to do on my own. So, um, so asking for help is something that's super uncomfortable. And then, you know, so I say I hate talking to strangers. I don't hate talking to strangers, but sometimes I really do. Um, sometimes I'm open and generous and I love these, you know, spontaneous conversations. But especially when we are networking for a job um, and in a situation where we don't know the people there, what do you say to them? How do you get a conversation started? Um, and even if it's not face to face, if we're doing this virtually, which is what we're doing these days, um, then again, it's what Megan talked about with the cold calling. Um, how, how do we do that? What's the script? And then the whole concept of, I don't like bothering people. Um, and, and again, I think this is, tends to be a really specific issue or common issue with RPCVs because we're used to helping people. That's why we got into the Peace Corps most of the time. And so to ask other people for help is kind of goes against our grain. And then finally, um, for a lot of us, and I think especially people who are more introverted, we tend to be comfortable when we're talking to our friends. And when we get outside of our bubble, outside of our community, then it just feels awkward and uncomfortable. And so these are the things that I want, that we're gonna go through kind of point by point. And, um, and as we go through them, I'm gonna you know, talk about different strategies. I'm gonna talk about um, a tool that is available to all um, members of the global reentry program to help make this process easier for you. And so, so again, as we go forward um, and you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and Jody will interrupt me at the appropriate time. Um, or again, unmute yourself um, because I do want this to really answer your particular challenges that you're facing. But let's start with um, networking is skeevy. Um, so basically, as much as possible, I really avoid the word networking. And at one point I even like broke it down and I'm just like, you know, so a net is something that traps you and working is something that is the opposite of playing. So being trapped and, and working, just the word itself um, doesn't bring up images of rainbows and puppy dogs. And, um, and so I just, I, I think one of the things that's helpful is to think about this concept differently. 
And so, um, so I like to use the phrase of building community. Um, some of my clients have come up with um, talking with friends or connecting with like-minded people or coffee chats um, and, or just, you know, the process of making friends. So that's one thing that I want to encourage you to do. Networking feels artificial, but all of these other things are generally things that we do in our day-to-day -day lives and that are hardwired into us. We are social beings. So being a part of a community, talking with our friends, um, you know, making connections with people who have the same values as, as we do. These are all really natural for us. So just by um, reframing and using different words to talk about the activity can be incredibly liberating. And so I just encourage you to like either pick one of these phrases or make up your own so that when you think about doing it, it doesn't fill you with dread. <laughs> um, ideally, I want it to fill you with joy and interest and excitement. And the other thing is that we often see networking as a one-way street. I have a favor that I'm trying to get you to fulfill. And so, but if we reframe this in terms of building community or being with friends, those are very mutual relationships where you're not just asking for favors, you're also there for the other person. And the other thing that's really important for us to know is that there's a lot of people out there that really enjoy helping others. And I'm gonna assume that there's several people on this presentation where, they in, where that gives them a sense of joy. And so, and for me, if someone comes up to me and, and I do get some people who are you know, interested in international development or Peace Corps or being a career counselor and, um, and if they ask a question that I can answer and or if I can connect them with someone who can answer that question, then that gives me kind of a warm glow. And so you are, you have the potential of making someone's day by asking for a favor. Now I want to put that in a, a little bit into perspective because not everyone is going to be really excited for you to just reach out from nowhere and say, hey, I'm interested in blah, blah, blah. Can we chat? Um, the, the best data that I have is that it's about a quarter of the population that really enjoys this process. And so really, the goal of networking is not to have a 100% success rate. It's not for everyone you reach out to, to respond to you. It's to find the people who really want to help you. And, and if you don't know that person, there's only one way to find out if the person you're reaching out to is a helper. I call them advocates because they're the people that like to advocate for others. Um, and that is to ask for help. And if they say yes, then chances are good that they're this person. And so, so when Megan was talking about cold calling, there is probably going to be some reaching out to strangers at some point during your job search process. So if you can remember that you're not hoping that everyone responds to you, but you're looking for someone who finds joy in helping others and that the best way of finding that person is to ask, then that can help reframe this whole concept of I'm here asking for a big favor. So are there any questions or comments about this? There's nothing in the chat box so far. I just put in something explain, you know, just encouraging people to put their questions in if they wanted. 
Um, so there might be something that comes in, but um, just in the meantime, while we're waiting, and please put your questions in there or you can unmute yourself right now um, as well if you do have questions for Rhonda. So, so I am gonna go to next um, aspect of why people tend to hate networking. And that is just the concept of asking for help. And so, so I kind of um, mentioned that Americans tend to have this concept of autonomy and independence. And, um, and this is actually more of a myth than a strategy, that you can do it all on your own doesn't really have basis in reality. And in fact, that phrase, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, um, is originally meant something impossible to do because you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can pull your boots on, but you, but basically to get real work done, we need to do that in an interdependent way. And so it's useful to remember that your ultimate goal is not just employment. It's something bigger than that. It's to make a contribution. And like I said, most of the people that I work with as a career consultant, I um, are interested in the social impact field. And I think most RPCVs or a lot of RPCVs are as well. And so, so remember that this is something bigger than a job and that using an effective strategy is, um, is serving a bigger purpose. So basically let's take the 30,000 foot level rather than the, you know, the five foot level of, I am asking this specific person to give me a job. Number one, that's not how I recommend that you network. <laughs> but number two, you really do want to think about what's the best way to make the kind of contribution I want in the world. And, and ultimately, you know, everyone on this planet, we are all in this together. And my belief and the reason why I got into the work that I did is I believe that getting people into their right fit career really makes the world a better place. There's less burnout, there's less angst, there's less crappy jobs out there if people are really doing what they love. And, um, and so by asking, by you know, building your community and asking for ideas and advice and leads and all of those kinds of things, that's helping you to make the kind of contribution that you uniquely can make. So, okay, so that's kind of the theory behind like um, how we can build community, how we can reframe networking to build community. I wanna get into the nuts and bolts. And so, so one of the things that I want, there's a couple of different types of quote unquote networking. And so asking for information, the informational interview. Um, so when you are generally like changing jobs or trying to figure out what you wanna do or doing some research into companies, what you're really doing is asking for information. And so you're not asking for a lead, you're not asking for a job you're trying to figure out something that you can't find online. And so basically before you start approaching people to ask them questions, um, you want to do your research ahead of time and that you want to go through a process that, so that you have real questions. Now you can Google informational interview questions, and you can get hundreds of them. And a lot of them are good. I recommend that you find your own. Like you 
do again, do the research. And when you get to a place where you're like, I don't understand this, then that's a question that you ask during an informational interview. Or is this really true? That's another question that you can ask. And, um, and the other thing that's really, really useful is to know what you personally want in your job and career so that you can ask about fit. So for example, um, a really common informational interview question is, tell me about uh, what a typical day looks like to, for you. And, um, and so that's pretty generic and you do get good information um, asking that. And it's often a question that I recommend that my clients ask if they really don't know what a person's doing. And the, but a lot of that you can kind of find online these days. There's lots of videos about what's the day in the life of a program manager or an engineer and that kind of stuff. What I think is more useful is to say something like, um, so I'm really interested in um, conducting research on social issues. How much do you do those kinds of activities in your job? Or, um, you know, I'm someone that gets really engaged when I'm working on teams. Does your job involve a lot of teamwork or is it more individual work? And so then you're getting information that's relevant for you. And you're also um, talking about yourself and your strengths without talking about yourself and your strengths. Um, so, you're, so you're not saying I'm the world's greatest people person. You're saying, this is where I thrive. I really do good work when I'm a part of a team. How do, how do teams in your organization function? Um, and the other thing that's really awesome about these kinds of questions is um, a lot of job satisfaction, a lot of um, whether or not you're happy at your work oftentimes depends on your colleagues and your boss. And, um, and you don't know in general what your boss is like if you apply for a job online. But if you're talking to people, you can ask questions like, I find that I do my best work when my boss is more of a mentor to me. Um, do you feel mentored in your current position? And so there's ways to get information that can really help you decide if that company, if that job, if that department is a good fit for you. And so I mentioned that there is a tool that's available, My Career Design Studio. Um, and so this is an online program that I designed um, to help walk people through kind of the whole career coaching process. And so I want to, um, to just share how My Career Design Studio can actually help people figure out how to conduct um, how to quote unquote networking. So I am going to um, share. So Jody, am I sharing my screen? You are. Okay, great. Um, so basically my career design studio has a bunch of different sections, my, raw materials. The, this is where you can um, understand yourself and come up with your goals and ideas. And then the napkin sketch is an area where you can figure out what do you want and what have you prioritized is important for you in a job. And, um, and so what I want to just talk through is how you can use my career design studio to come up with some questions. And so under my career design, there is an activity called my gap analyses. And so this is where you start, you look at the different kinds of jobs that, that you think might be a good fit for you. And then you dig a little deeper. So, so for example, um, this is just some, some kind of 
jobs that I've come up with. Some of them are good fit for me, some of them not so much. But if you go to the edit information, then it asks you, so what are the job requirements? So look at a, you know, a teacher job description. What are some of the job requirements that I have? So bachelor's degree experience in this, that, and the other thing. What are the job requirements that I need to attain? And so then you can see what you don't have. Um, it gives you a chance to then identify what are some ways that I can obtain these requirements. So maybe I can take a class in this or ask other teachers about how they manage multiple school schedules, for example. And then there's a section for questions that you have about this job. And so as you're thinking about um, the job description and is it a good fit for you and do you have what it takes right now to get that job or do you need some additional information um, you can just jot down like where can I get these classes on watershed science and equipment or how do you manage um, scheduling multiple schools and, um, and because I know myself I am not a naturally organized person and the job description seems to indicate that that's important so I want to know if that's something that I'm not good at would this job still be okay for me and so by doing that um, you've got an you, you're starting to think about some questions that you can ask people that'll help you really understand, is this a good job for you? There is another activity. Rhonda, oh. Rhonda before, you, before you go on, I just wanna ask, um, there's a question about just clarifying here. Um, I have, regarding the gap analysis, when you, when you first had the list of several different um, job titles, Yes, you had and it said, you know, comparing those. Where does that list come from? Is that based on an assessment, something that you conducted and it comes out with jobs you might be good at? Or is it just you plug in the information? You plug in the title of whatever job you're interested in, in doing a gap analysis on? That's a really good question because it's actually a combination of both. Okay. So with my career design studio, you start with um, the foundation which is just basically, you know, um, you know, where you're at right now. And one of them um, is possible job titles. Gotcha. And so that's where you start. There's also a career assessment that you take mm -hmm. and then you get results from that where then you start selecting what are your strengths, mm -hmm. what are your challenges, what are your abilities and skills. Yep. And so you're developing a list that during the napkin sketch, so again, raw materials is all about you. The napkin sketch is, okay, what kind of job might be a good fit for me? And then as you go through and you select what's important, then my exploration starts bringing everything together. Now, okay. I just want to say for mine, I've done this and redone this so many times that it really narrowed, um, narrowed my jobs. And um, <laughs> so I'm actually uh, have a lot more options than just being a, a urologist. But, um, but because this is kind of like my test, um, my test account, um, this is what it comes up for me. So yours is not going to look like this. It's going to have a few more. Um, but then what, what that allows you to do. So you've got your list of potential jobs. This mm -hmm. is what you've said. Hey, I think I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And then my exploration, you can actually click on a job title and, um, and it takes you to a really extensive online database called ONET Online, yeah. where then you can see, okay, what does a urologist do? And am I really interested in, in, in um, treating erectile dysfunction or not? And um, if the answer is no, then you might not want to go further. Um, so, so it really is it mostly comes from you and then the program gotcha. gives you different options for you to explore further and and just one other thing with onet um 
that it can also gives you other different kinds of job titles so that you can see, oh, there might be some other things that are interesting. Mm -hmm. And then further down um, to, let's see, where is it? Like you can look for different job openings and I thought, and the credentials for that. And I thought there were some related jobs. No, maybe that's just up here. So, so again, for people who don't know what they want to do, that mm -hmm. exploration is great. If you, um, if you do know what you want to do, then some of this stuff you can skip. Um, Got it. So, so thank, yeah, you. thank you for that. That's great. And, and there aren't any other questions right now in the chat box. I've done another kind of plug for any questions. If they can write them down or um, if they do prefer to say them. So, okay, excellent. Um, a couple other things I just want to show you in my career design studio. There is an activity called um, my fit with career design essentials. So the career design essentials are the things that you've selected are most important to you. And in this activity, you can actually compare different mm -hmm. kinds of jobs to what you say are your have to haves, which is what's most important to you, nice to haves, which is generally everything else, and then icing on the cake like, oh, this would be nice, but I don't necessarily need it. Mm -hmm. This is useful because, okay, say we're, I'm thinking about becoming a teacher and, um, and I don't, you know, I marked a maybe for does this reward original thinking? And so if I don't know if a job would let me do that, then this is another question that you can ask. And then um, finally, there's a very handy activity called planning partner building conversations. And this allows you to actually create an agenda. So if, um, so for example, here's all the different questions that I've ar already said I want to know about. You can add something new. Um, and then we've got um, a way for you to just kind of think through how to structure these conversations. So, um, so you start with what do you have in common? You can talk about that for about five minutes. What are your most important questions? And then ask for recommendations on your next steps. So this is basically an agenda for a 15 or 20 minute networking conversation. Um, but this is all based on best practices to start building rapport and getting information. Rhonda, we have a question that's actually um, a very good question here. I'm going to feed it to you. Um, so Megan shares, you know, given how most interactions today are virtual, right, both uh, work and personal, I often hear people complain about how they're zoomed out or have screen fatigue. So her question is, how can I make a request for a virtual conversation with someone stand out or make it more appealing? Um, or perhaps you have general recommendations on how to navigate new challenges or changes in networking that have come about as a result of COVID-19. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I would say in general is to be flexible and and what I mean by that is, you know, we don't have the same options that we had nine, 10 months ago. And so in general, I have always been a big fan of talking to people face to face if you can. So, you know, going out for coffee or something like that. And since that is not recommended right now, um, Zoom is generally a good um, a good replacement for that. But also we still have the phone <laughs> and that can be, that can give someone a break because if you're on zoom, you kind of have to make sure your hair looks okay. And, um, and sometimes you just don't want to go through that effort. And 
so that phone call so basically what i would recommend is to ask for um you know do you have time where we can talk on zoom or, or over the phone or any other way that works for you so um so yeah i do think that that's a good question and the other thing that i would say is what i've been reading about with um with zoom fatigue is a lot of times that is with multiple people because our brains just aren't um aren't haven't evolved <laughs> yet to you know be to do really well on zoom and so um so by looking at people and seeing yourself staring right back at you um can be really disconcerting and so that goes away if you're just talking to one other person so just give the person that option um i like to be able to see people it makes me feel like i'm making a, a live connection i and i get zoom fatigue but if i'm just talking to someone one-on-one -on -one, i wouldn't um be uncomfortable with that so so yeah i think that for all of this, whether, you know, we're in the midst of a pandemic or where, you know, things are where we're able to interact with people, and go out for lunch and coffee with total strangers again, uh, that flexibility and um, is, is useful. So, so that's kind of the general advice. Great. And Rhonda, there's one more question in the chat box that actually is very related. It's part of um, the last question, but um, what changes have you seen in networking in general under our new circumstances? And you did address part of that in terms of, you know, um, you know, the, the phone or, you know, Zoom. The reality of the matter too is just to contribute here is that um, before COVID, how many of you had ever done an informational interview or career chat via Zoom? I sure hadn't. <laughs> it was typically in person or via phone. So, you know, if you can do in person, right, it's great. Right, Rhonda? But you know, uh, by phone is fine too. So yeah, exactly. And um, the one thing that I would say that has changed that a lot of my clients have seen is that even though um, actually they are getting more positive responses than they did before mm -hmm. the pandemic. And the reason why that is, is because you actually then represent novelty. You're something new. And yeah. I don't know, I, I know many people, myself included, we just feel like the days just blend together. I don't know if it's Monday or Saturday. And, um, and so just working from home and not having that demarcation between work and personal life um, yeah. means that Ta and and also just that craving for connection so m most people haven't found zoom fatigue that i've talked to as being a real obstacle and so so the other aspect too is that this allows you to really broaden yourself geographically that you don't have yeah. to just meet with somebody who's within you know 25 miles of where you live you can talk to people across the across the world and um and so i think that people are getting used to this kind of networking and this kind of relationship building and so i've actually seen this be a real asset and um and, you know, I think there's going to be, you know, some type of diminishing returns. It might be that we're on the, the lower end of things, but I haven't seen um, that be a real obstacle for my clients. What about you, Jody? Have you, have you noticed anything? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I would say, I think exactly what you said, people are willing to help people want to help in in general you said because the novelty is one you know one reason right they, they're craving you know connection but also just in general i mean especially if you're really targeting like rpcvs you know fellow return volunteers they are your family if you will and so a much greater percentage of them 
would be probably more, the vast majority would be more than welcome to try to, you know, connect with you at some point. They may be really busy sometimes, but, um, but yes. So I, I, I find that you, you aren't going to have trouble connecting with people, getting people who are willing to talk to you. This is really one of the most um, powerful things about being an RPCB is that we have got a huge and generous community. And, um, and so, so we actually have a huge advantage over a majority of Americans. And so I don't want, um, and, and Megan, I mean, it's interesting that you bring that up. I think that a lot of us um, can almost create obstacles for ourselves. Like, but what about this? And what about that? And, um, you know, maybe this person doesn't want to be on Zoom anymore. So maybe I shouldn't bother them. And, and again, um, the goal is not to get every single person to talk to you. The person who wants to help you isn't, you know, they're, they're going to find a way. If they're tired of Zoom, they'll suggest a phone call um, or they'll, you know, they'll just power through. And so if we, if we take a look at our questions and our fears, you know, like, is this going to work? Um, I, if, again, going back to the reframing of let's see if this will work. Let's see what happens. And so have this be an experiment or an opportunity to learn. Um, does this work? Does this not? You want to give yourself uh, chances to really see if it works. So you don't want to reach out to one person. And if they don't respond, say, oh, networking is for the birds. Um, you generally have to reach out to four or five people to get a response. And sometimes you got to reach out to 10 or 15. And so part of the, um, part of what I want you to think about is how do you keep yourself motivated? And so I want you to reward yourself for the effort. You, um, instead of, you know, asking someone to talk to you and, um, and you just stop there to give yourself a little reward after that. I mean, there's, there's all these tips and tricks to kind of help us do things that make us uncomfortable. Breaking down into small steps, taking one step at a time, rewarding yourself for doing the action, not the results. Okay. Oh, I'm going into my talking mode and I still have a lot of information to share. So, um, so, okay, I was talking about how there's two different ways of figuring out what to say. And so if you're asking for information, do your research. If you're asking for leads, I recommend that you start with the re relationships that you already have. You don't want to call up a stranger and say, do you know of any jobs that I'm qualified for? <laughs> and so that's why you start by asking information. You build your relationships and then you can go back to that person and say, I am super interested in your organization. Do you know of any, any jobs that I might be qualified for? And by asking a question in that respect, you make it easy for them to say yes or no. Oh yeah, here's a job. And then they, you know, they spend two minutes crafting an email to you and then you've got a lead that you wouldn't have had before. And um, so, versus I'm really interested in um, working for your organization. What do you think I should do next? Right? Because then I have to remember what we talked about, remember all of these different things and figure out a strategy for you. Don't ask people to create a strategy for you. Ask them a very simple question that they can, um, that is very easy for them to answer. So how do you start? Um, you already have a network and most people discount that. They think that networking is talking to strangers. It does not have to be talking with strangers. Like again, my first job, someone I was related to. And so, and that's also ways of building your confidence in easy wins. Who do you know, whether or not they're in the field that you want to know 
about. Um, they might know somebody who is. So start with who you know. And then everyone you talk to, I always recommend you end your conversation with, do you recommend, is there anyone else that you think I should talk to? And if they say, oh yeah, I've got, you know, blah, 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 then you can ask them for an email introduction. And then you've got a warm connection with that person. You're not cold calling them. And so this is, um, in research, they call this snowball sampling. So you start with one person and then ask, you know, who else do you know? And then you interview those people and so on and so on and so on. And then um, as Jody and I were talking about, you start with your communities. RPCV is a huge one, but your alumni network is also really big. And, um, and one trick um, that has been in some of the other webinars that I've given are to go onto LinkedIn. There are alumni pages for every college and university where you can then search for people in your field or in the job titles you want. And that is that person's a part of your community, even if you don't know them. And, and then often we do get to a point where we want to talk to somebody that we don't have a connection to. So how do we do that? Um, so I recommend, I mean, again, right now we're not going to be doing any networking events. So if you know the person that you're looking for, um, start by Googling their name and then email and, uh, and generally the place that they work, because if you can get a work email, that's the one that's most likely going to get a response. But LinkedIn is, is a great resource too. And so you can make a connection request and just say, I found your profile on LinkedIn. I'm really interested in the job that you're doing or the company that you work for. And I was wondering if you might have five or 10 minutes or 10 or 20 minutes where I can, um, where you can tell me about what you do. And so, so basically these approaches are actually fairly simple. So there's a book um, called The Two Hour Job Search by Steve Dalton. And these are his recommendations for these quote unquote cold approaches. So have them be short and sweet. Um, you don't have to say I'm looking for a job um, because they generally know <laughs> that that's what you're looking for. Put your connection first. We're, you know, we're both RPCVs. We both served in the same country. And then generalize your interest. And what he means by that is to say, I'm interested in your company. Um, and then he recommends having, um, ending with, I know things are really busy. So um, if I don't hear from you, I'll follow up with you next week and see if we can't find another time. And so that basically lets them know that um, that if they if they want to reach out to you but now's just not the right time you'll send them a gentle reminder um, any questions I want to actually say that um, this process is also oops that's not what I want to share hold on um, all right, Zoom work for me here. Um, under my career creation tools, you've got my approach to potential partners. And if you go to the instruction section, this gives you what I just shared with you. And it gives you a couple of examples as well. And so if you want to know like what that actually looks like, you can find that in my career design studio. And so then the last thing, how not to be a bother. <laughs> so once you've talked, once you've sent out an email, um, don't spam them. Don't email them every day for two weeks. I recommend one or two follow-up emails. 
And then you'll know, okay, this person isn't the person for me to talk to. And then you can reach out to somebody else in that organization. Um, another thing that I recommend is that you don't email 15 people in the same department or the same agency. You just kind of go organization by organization so that, um, so that they, they're not feeling like they're being spammed. And like I said, um, you're looking for the people who want to help you. And so, um, so yeah, if you don't get a response, then realize this isn't the person for you to be talking to. Once you've had the initial conversation, I recommend that you stay connected um, because again, you're building community. So an email every one or two months um, helps keep you front of mind without being a bother. And also when you're talking to people, when you're doing informational interviews, I recommend that one of your questions is, what's your biggest challenge? And then that gives you an, the ability to um, be helpful for them. And so, so if they say, you know, like time management is my biggest challenge, then when you email them a month or so later, you can say, hey, I found this really great article on time management that I thought might be interesting to you. And so then you start developing some reciprocity. It helps you feel better that you're giving something and not just taking. And then they see that um, you're someone who listens and someone who is paying attention and who cares about making their life easier. Those are great qualities to have um, in a future employee. And, and again, you, um, I don't recommend that you be super aggressive with your ask. But I also don't recommend that you be coy, like saying something like, yeah, if something comes up, let me know. You can remind people, I would still love to be a program manager in your organization. Um, let me know if anything, if you see any opportunities that I might be a good fit for. And as long as you're not hounding them, what you're doing is just reminding them of who you are then that just that is what helps turn networking into jobs and i'll just go through this really quickly and um just to remember that part of the point of this is to turn these cold contacts into friends so that makes the conversation more comfortable as you continue to network, you will build out your community and your friendships. So, um, so if you meet somebody that you really connect with, then hang out with them. And that makes, that's how this process becomes a joy. And so obviously what we do now um, is not to go out for coffee but we can still have coffee dates over Zoom or over the phone. And, and if we chat about things other than I'm looking for a job, can you help me? Then that really starts, starts strengthening a bond and they're gonna naturally want to do that. Okay, like always, um, I have given a whole lot of information. Um, I am happy to stick around if anyone's got any more questions. But what I recommend that you do next is to spend some time today, even if it's five minutes, just thinking about what are your personal challenges to networking and what can you do to overcome those challenges. And so um, a lot of the time, the answer to what can you do to overcome the challenges is to just do it. <laughs> um, but um, but sometimes you might want to ask for support. Um, I do have a Facebook group that people who use my career design studio and are a part of um, 
you know, the RPCB community so that you can like talk to other people who are in the same situation that you are and, you know, find some accountability buddies. There are a lot of ways of overcoming your challenges. The trick is finding um, a way that works for you. Okay. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, Rhonda, um, in our chat box, there aren't any questions right now, but maybe people can, um, if you do have questions, can you just unmute? We'll give you a few seconds here and uh, see if you're interested in sharing. And one thing that I will say um, that in our follow-up email, we will, you know, share the, the different tools, a link to My Career Design Studio, um, I also have developed an interactive career guide that um, is kind of like your coach through email. And, mm -hmm. and so we'll give you links to all these different tools that help with the job search overall. Right. Thank you, Rhonda. And, and I know they receive like four months, which is awesome. Four months free use of that. Um, so I just encourage people to start using it as soon as you can. We will get that, um, that uh, follow up email out to you. We generally get that out within a, a one, one to three business days. So I'm sure it will be easy to, to get it out quickly here. So folks can start um, using that. Um, are there, um, if there are, okay, so folks, um, some folks have to run, um, but just to remind folks as well, Rhonda and I are doing on the first Wednesday of each month, we're doing a career Q and A um, just a chat between us and, and answering questions from the audience. You know, both of us are, are coaches and, and um, work in, you know, the, the job search arena. So if any of you want to tune in, our next one is next Wednesday, and you can always register for that event or any of our other events. This Friday, I'm doing a how to get unstuck in the job search process, Friday at noon Eastern time. So just, you can always go to our calendar, which is just peacecorpsconnect.org slash events and then you can register for any of our uh, upcoming events so i'll put that in the chat box here as well but are there any final questions folks have for rhonda before uh we wrap this up here so i hope that this was helpful and um and in the follow-up email I'll, I'll also um, give you access and um, I'll share my email address with you. So if you've got more questions, um, you can just email me directly and I'll be happy to, to point you in the right direction. So I hope that this was helpful. Um, again, this is something that a lot of people struggle with. So you are not alone. Like I said, I really struggled with this. I've taken my own advice and found it to be really helpful. So I hope you do too. Thank you everyone for being a part of this. Have a great, have a great.